Let me start by introducing myself. I lead a part of one of the two major research organizations in Intel Labs. Yesterday you heard Mark talk about how the fact that we have an organization doing research that's related to our process technology and the devices and integration of devices. Part of their charter basically is to create the technologies that keep Moore's Law going. I'm part of a larger organization, Intel Labs, that really works from circuits on up, looking into new architectures, new circuits, new algorithms, basically from uh, taking advantage of the new technologies coming along and working together, as in this project, with the folks who were creating the new silicon technology. Uh, quantum computing is a collaboration between the two organizations. Uh, I, my counterpart in the technology and manufacturing group, Components Research, is also Jim, Jim Clark. We have some fun with the fact that there are two Jims working together. Uh, I am not a physicist, I'm a computer scientist, although at Intel, computer scientists quickly learn a lot about hardware. And so I have worked in the labs since 1990 on everything from uh, many core architecture and algorithms to the development of the USB 2 interface for our chips. Uh, a broad background, which actually is very helpful in what is very much an interdisciplinary effort within Intel. Uh, we've heard this story over and over again. It's worth noting that we're reduced to using metaphors a lot in talking about quantum computing to broad audiences. Since the uh, quantum mechanics is not intuitive. And so, yes, we have inexact analogies. They're the best we have. They are helpful. Uh, sometimes we're using them just to exaggerate a point. I would have thought the 300 entangled qubits to be an example of overkill. On the other hand, after hearing the cosmology talk, I think we might have a customer for several hundred qubits just to model the state that Debbie was talking about dealing with yesterday. Uh, fragility has been high. Noise, air is an unavoidable byproduct of the fact that qubits interact with their environment. We take advantage of it and we suffer from it. It affects our algorithms. It's a basic characteristic. Uh, it will drive the demand for scaling to millions of qubits and is a first order challenge that we're seeing affect the design of a future quantum computer all the way up and down the stack. So what is the promise of quantum computing? Well, it's using that parallelism because you can represent in the state of those qubits tremendous amount of information and with a circuit or algorithm, transform it into results. You do have to be careful because if you measure it, the quantum state collapses probabilistic to a single of uh, part of that distribution in your results. So one of the major challenges that we're going to face in exploiting quantum is learning how to design algorithms that work with that reality that we are going to have to think in terms of probabilistic computing, and we're going to have to think in terms of distributions. Uh, Peter Shor's algorithm was a real breakthrough before, because he found a way to create a global characteristic of the distribution. Uh, we have many problems where we are simply reducing the result to a small enough set that we can sample it uh, realistically. But it's very important to realize that an algorithmic challenge that is really going to be a barrier to adoption of this technology is input, taking data into the system and representing it in the qubits, or state preparation, the counterpart in other algorithms, and output are going to be limiting factors, particularly in HPC. We hear the press talking a lot about many applications that will need us to figure out how to solve those two problems. Uh, because on its face, first order, 
it's not big data friendly. You can easily lose any speed up that you might have in the operation of the computation in input and output, particularly in HPC and AI space. We mentioned, several people have mentioned before, that the fact that there are some cases where the quantum algorithm promises much better scaling. That does tend to be exaggerated. Uh, again, the press tends to pick up on the idea that there's exponential speed up, which, uh, well, is not uniformly true. There are many algorithms that really, where there's limited, if any, and uh, many others where there's polynomial speed up. And as the speaker from NASA mentioned earlier, uh, it will not solve all the NP-complete problems. So it provides the opportunity to address some problems that are intractable, but not by solving the, the issue of all exponentially uh, complex algorithms. But it does, with many cases where it's possible to get exponential or high polynomial speed up, really allow us to address things that we can't address just by scaling traditional architectures. Now, it's captured the imagination of the world, the scientific community, as well as the press, because there are so many places, uh, even just in optimization, uh, where we're unable to do what we would like, and we see potential uh, opportunities that are limited by scale. Uh, everything from ordinary uh, optimization of logistics to uh, pharma's modeling of new drugs and the interactions among drugs and receptor sites. Things like cryptography are going to be way out in time because they're the most demanding of the error correction. They're going to be uh, needing to tackle large problems with precision that will mean that they will be far down the road and probably will have anticipated them with new cryptographic technology. Things like weather forecasting that involve large amounts of data. Similarly, we'll have to wait for solutions to the problem of encoding and reading out large amounts of data. So if we're going to develop a quantum computing system, and that's the focus of our research at Intel, uh, we really need to address the entire system. Uh, we see a stack with challenges to be addressed at each level. Based on our experience with developing traditional computer systems, we realize this is something we're no stranger to. Uh, I'd like to emphasize the fact that they're not addressed independent of each other. You can work on all of them at the same time, but there are dependencies among them that are key to being successful. Understanding, for example, the impact of changes in the control electronics on the effectiveness of your algorithm, on the topology and connectivity possible in your uh, qubit chip on the algorithm and the demands on the control electronics. All of those things involve trade-offs and alternatives that if you work together in an interdisciplinary team, you will have opportunities that you won't if you look at them in isolation. And that's the way we are working together with our collaboration partners. Now, a couple of years ago, we formed a partnership with an organization that had expertise in a wide range of qubit technologies uh, in the Netherlands. QTech is a combination of Technical University of Delft and TNO, an applied research organization sponsored by the government. They have expertise in qubit operation and control across a wide range of technologies, uh, ranging from superconducting to spin qubits to uh, topological qubits. They have a large program with Microsoft on that topic that we're not involved in. We realized that we would need to partner with a group that complemented the expertise we have in system architecture and control electronics and 
uh, the patterning and uh, atomic layer packaging, all of those things are things that we have a lot to bring to take the phenomenon out of the laboratory environment to deal with the problems of the personalities of qubits, the variation from device to device, the need for re, uh, uniformity and purity of materials that are going to help address the fragility and the, the noisiness of the qubits. So we're in a 10-year uh, partnership, a couple of years along, learning a great deal from them and vice versa, and making some good progress on what I'm going to be outlining as examples picked from the things that we're doing at each level in the stack. I'm not going to be reporting so much results here. We just reported a significant amount of things in both algorithm and uh, qubit technologies and such at the March APS meeting, which is an example of the setting at which we would go into detail. But I do want to help you understand our approach and, and our progress by sort of giving you a sample in each of the areas and talking about some of the issues. So let's start at the bottom, uh, near the silicon, which is a foundation, uh, but also very logical for a semiconductor company like Intel, where we're looking at qubit device design and fabrication. Uh, in, that's an area of intense collaboration with our partners at Delft. We bring expertise that is unusual, very unusual in the research space of quantum computing on assembly and packaging technology, which I'll talk a little bit about because it is an important but not necessarily recognized uh, value to advancing progress towards a system as well as exploring topology and connectivity, which is one of the major scaling challenges we face with whatever qubit type we have. We're working on two different types, and I think that's unusual as well. Your materials earlier only talked about our work with superconducting. We're also working on quantum dot spin qubits in silicon. Uh, that again is a, a method we use a lot in developing advanced technology at Intel. We explore a couple of options that look relevant to us where we have something to offer uh, and don't pick or narrow down to one until further along until we have much more experience and basis to, to choose from. So we're conducting uh, is clearly much more mature. It's the focus of many of the efforts like our uh, Google's effort, for example, and IBM and Rigetti. Uh, we're working on that because we have manufacturing and packaging and control electronic expertise that's relevant to it. Uh, we're also working on spin in because of exam uh, advantages in scaling. It's essentially oh, a million times more dense. We're talking about features of 100 nanometers over here where the uh, transmons are macroscopic. You can see them. Uh, these are on the right are very much like transistors that we're very familiar with and know how to manufacture uniformly, reliably, and precisely. A little strange looking single electron transistor, but uh, nonetheless very similar. And we're exploiting our expertise in fabrication and design there. Uh, looking at first at superconducting qubit progress, we started working, learning how to do resonators, worked our way through six qubit systems, a seven qubit away, 17, and our Tangle Lake 49 qubit superconducting chip, which is at Delft now being measured and characterized. It's a long cycle, taking a chip and cooling it down to superconducting temperatures and doing the characterization on it and competing with the other work going on at Delft for refrigerator space. Uh, so we continue to buy more of these dilution fridges. Never seem to be enough or enough time in them. Why 17, why 49? Not arbitrary numbers, we're not so much going for a 
quantum supremacy number with 49, that matches the requirements of the surface code work that's being done by our partner, uh, Leo DiCarlo at, uh, DiCarlo at Delft. 17 allows one stage of air correction. 49 is the next uh, dimension up with the, fi the D5. And so we're preparing something that he will be able to work with to explore his air correction implementation on it. Uh, we're also in that progression looking at packaging technology, one of the things that we had to work a lot to wrestle with. For example, moving from wire bonding, which does not scale well in the long term particularly, to flip chip bonding, figuring out how to make something that you could put to the ultra coat temperature without it disconnecting and exploding and warping. There's a special uh, superconducting indium large ball grid array that makes possible connecting to these that we had to develop. Uh, as we designed a large chip, we discovered that the, uh, there were special requirements to avoid the packaging interfering with the introduction of spurious RF resonance modes. Uh, you'll see here these little dots, which are superconducting TSVs connecting the ground plane that dissipates, prevents that interference, for example. So packaging technology, interconnect technology, has been a focus of our work. And scaling from the six-port system to the 49 introduced new problems that we were wrestling with that we have resolved to that point, and now it's into the fridge for characterization of single and, and two qubit operations at Delft. On spin qubits, we have used our 39 millimeter <coughs> process technology to create a wafer full of linear arrays of spin qubits. Uh, you can see in the right hand side, progressively blowing up sections of the uh, representation and then a cross section to get to the point where we have the individual gates that are gonna host the quantum dots in the linear array. Uh, we've been working with individual lab devices. We have been characterizing the devices at room temperature as far as the quality of the materials, the uh, mobility, a key measure of the, the purity of the system. We've been characterizing the transistors that we put on the same die uh, in order to make sure that we've done everything we can before you go to the next step of, of creating the quantum dots, which is next for us, and then uh, creating the qubits where you can manipulate the uh, electrons in and out of the quantum dots. One of the things that makes quantum dots interesting to us, the, the spin qubits, is that they have very long relaxation times, very uh, long-lived and less sensitive to temperature increases. Getting down to the two-digit 15, 20 millikelvin really limits the cooling capacity. You can do that with a dilution fridge, but you cannot put much heat there because it cannot take that much uh, load. Even moving to one kelvin gives you uh, order of magnitude or more uh, cooling power that you can take advantage of potentially to use for electronics on the die, for multiplexing, for example, the signals off, onto the, uh, off the connector. Uh, so at APS, we reported some work with our colleagues at Delft exploring the sensitivity of the uh, devices to temperature and the nature of charge noise as you increased the 1 over F noise that, that uh, you get with temperature uh, and reported results that make us very optimistic that we will be able to make use of uh, the higher temperatures, bring it up to somewhere between 1 and 4 Kelvin, which gives us a lot of options. So again, spin qubits are very early, 
just recently demonstrated two qubit operations. Uh, but they have advantages that make it worth continuing to look at those as well. Control electronics uh, are really important. Uh, implementing error correction, resolving problems of input and output to the qubit plane uh, as you up, scale up, and we're looking ahead of where we are right now, long range in terms of solving problems of interconnection, and getting precise and reliable digital and analog control. Those are all key parts of the stack. Let's see if this will go. Even getting off the die is a real challenge. Uh, the 49 qubit transmon array requires 108 pins. And that ratio is way off what we depend upon when we scale up to a processor with 10 to the ninth transistors and only 1,000 pins. There are really good financial and technological limits that force that. Uh, very expensive to go to uh, greater connectivity than that. Memory is able to connect with even fewer uh, by addressing blocks, by doing multiplexing, various techniques we don't know how to do yet on qubits. And one of the problems that we need to address if we're going to get to the scale that's needed to tackle large problems with many physical qubits for each logical qubit. One other problem related to connectivity is however many we have at that ratio Running the RF cables into and out of the fridge is a tremendous load on the system. Uh, it also causes attenuation of the signals. Long term, we believe that as much as possible, and we hope to move digital as well as RF drive electronics down into the fridge. And we have world experts on cryo CMOS technology at Delft that we're working with to design a control chip in CMOS that can do the generation of the waveforms and the precise delivery in phase and time of the shaped pulses to the qubits of whichever kind. Uh, and gives us the advantages that integration typically gives. We can do a lot of advanced DSP control technology on an integrated circuit like that and eventually move more and more of the uh, control electronics close to the qubits. Compilers and runtimes. Well, algorithms are hard to write, and as with any developer, they'll miss opportunities, certainly don't want to waste time in routine optimizations that we can teach a compiler to do at the high level, or mapping to the topology and connectivity of a particular design of a chip, particularly one that is perhaps using a crossbar design with limited uh, control parallelism, for example. There are special requirements for a compiler in qubits uh, because of constraints that are in the hardware. And if you're doing an error correction regime, then operations become much more complex than the simple two qubit is uh, you're actually operating on a, a, an abstract representation of the logic. And you want a logical operation mapped down to the physical. So that's an important thrust. We're using a tool that we put together in collaboration with uh, Harvard and uh, Professor Troyer, who will be coming up later at ETH Zurich, uh, that is a high performance qubit simulator. Uh, we have made it open source and encourage people to use it, a C++-based, gate-based simulator that uh, we've done to 42 qubits. Other people have taken it to 45. We are experimenting with additional enhancements to it. It allows us to do things like experiment with scheduling under constraints, logical dependency of operation, uh, the, the exclusive activation that's possible with operations, as well as physical connectivity. This is an example of a paper that explores three different, more complex, increasingly complex approaches to optimizing for operations on a linear array. And finally, 
perhaps most important, is figuring out what are going to be the compelling applications. Uh, exploring resilient algorithms that might be useful before we have fault tolerant operation. Uh, looking at what might be future real workload examples to use on early systems to guide the co-design, to understand the impact of trade-offs. So uh, if you look at the algorithm space, 50 qubits is an important milestone for proving a complexity argument. Uh, you really need much more like 1,000 qubits to tackle problems in chemistry and material design and optimization initially. You'll need many more for fault tolerant operation. So we've taken toy problems in, e in categories, each of those categories, like material science. Here's an example of one illustrates the transition between a conductor and an insulator state uh, of a very simple quantum mechanical system, again in collaboration with Zurich, and that we've run on an ion trap system at University of Maryland with a collaboration with Chris Monroe. Uh, we've been exploring algorithms that are resilient because they partition the algorithm between the classical system and the quantum system allowing you to put a simpler, shorter, less error vulnerable than piece of the uh, algorithm on the quantum system and do what the classical system is capable of doing. We've used that on a quantum chemistry problem to explore the impact of noise on the algorithm. Uh, again, published that result uh, that we developed with Harvard and, and Lawrence Berkeley Lab. In machine learning, we're doing several things, including, again, with Harvard, exploring how you might do a quantum neuron, a neuron concept to use in a neural network implementation, exploiting the parallelism, again, of a quantum computer. Uh, the challenge there was to come up with a repeat until success circuit that would create a nonlinear transfer function, a sigmoid, that's needed for neural networks but isn't natural to a quantum system, which is linear. Finally, as we look at the whole system, uh, we see that we need to move from simple metrics about the devices to things that reflect the behavior of the system in order to guide us with trade-offs and constraints and co-design for scaling. We've been focusing, we still value measurement of the device level metrics, but we're interested and are developing uh, many more metrics, not seeking a single benchmark or a single metric, which I think is an oversimplification, but what are the metrics that in combination allow us to characterize the system and understand the impact of what we do at each level. So we got tremendous excitement about quantum computing and we're applying our expertise in process and architecture even so, with all the problems we've identified and they've talked about, there's a great deal of work to do. Ten years seems very close <laughs> and uh, not really all that unusual for a brand new computer system architecture. And boilerplate saying this is not product information, this is research. <laughs>